Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have Adva Vilchinski with us tonight. She is the Council of Public Diplomacy at the Council General of Israel's office in New York City. But before we begin, I would like to introduce our moderator. Tonight's event is moderated by Maccabi USA First Vice President and our 21st Maccabee Soccer Commissioner, Donald Kent. Don has been involved with Maccabi USA since competing on the open men's soccer team at the 1979 Pan American Maccabi Games in Mexico City. He has competed at every soccer level since and helped build our master's soccer program over the past 20 years. Professionally, Don has spent 13 years working in the Jewish Federation system before transitioning to private wealth management. Don's a great guy, he's awesome to work with, and we're very lucky to have him here with us tonight and always. And with that, all right, Steve, I'll, I'll send you the five bucks now. That was good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome everybody. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. Um, we, uh, uh, for those of you who are new to our programming, uh, we're, we're gonna have everyone on mute. We ask you to stay on mute, but we very much welcome you to enter questions in the chat. Um, because we will make this as interactive as we can. It's Steve's job while Abda and I are chatting to uh, point out any decent questions. If they're not decent, he won't point them out. So try and make them decent, would you? Okay, so, so let's get started. Abda, hi, how are you? I'm good. I was wondering if I was the only one seeing like green stuff out of my video now, or it was you also. That's why I turn off the, the camera and I see no green stuff there. So. Now I'm even better. We, we are glad you're not seeing green stuff. And um, uh, uh, that's awesome. We hope you're seeing straight and clear. So I, I, I want people to get to know you a little bit. You and I have had a chance to talk. Um, so g give us a little background. Uh, you grew up in Tel Aviv. Um, tell us a little something about uh, your childhood, your parents, just to give people a little bit of insight into sort of what causes someone like you to be doing the amazing things that you're doing. Sure, but first of all, maybe that's the way I'll prove that I'm a really Israeli. I'll be rude and a little bit chutzpah. I will start by saying thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, and thank you, Don, and thank you all of the participants here and those who are not here and wanted to be here in Maccabi USA. Uh, I knew Maccabi U USA a little bit and with conversation preparing to this uh, uh, interview and evening, I, I learned much more and I'm, super excited to be here and I really want to thank you and I appreciate everything that each of one of you are doing and I guess we'll discover even more during this conversation so that's what my first chutzpah my second is of course with everything which is happening uh happy Sukkot, Chag Sameach, Moadim Simcha and now I'll tell you about myself <laughs> so I was born and raised in, in Tel Aviv which is for many people like saying yeah I was born and raised in New York so I feel here like uh, I'm now in New York City, so I feel like I'm in, in the right place in that uh, matter. Um, I'm the youngest with uh, four children, which is can be quite um, not regular to those days for Ashkenazi family. Uh, I was um, like a scout girl all of my life, uh, but I was all, also, if I connect to, to Maccabi USA, very sportive uh, girl all of my Wounds that I have is with roller skating uh, around uh, Tel Aviv. Um, I had, I think, just a regular Israeli childhood being in the scouts and being trying, you know, to educate kids how to be better citizens. Then after that, um, like every Israeli, I was enrolled to the army. I've been two years in the army regularly, and then one year I was an officer. Uh, after that, I said, okay, like every Israeli, I need to go to the big trip after the army. I spent uh, almost six months in South America. Then I came back and I said, for me, only if, if I need to leave Tel Aviv, which I really, really love Tel Aviv, for any city in, in Israel, it will be only for Be'er Sheva, because I really believe in the Negev and in the desert and with the story of Ben Gurion University. So I left to study in Ben Gurion University. I study political science and psychology. I did there my bachelor, then I continue for a master degree there. Um, a lot of things in between uh, that I guess uh, Don will ask me about them uh, a bit later. Yeah, if I, if I don't, you should be chutzpah dick again and call me out. 
but go ahead. Sure, 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 sure. Same here. If I'm speaking too much, you know, that's no, my job. I'm a great. diplomat. You just tell me stop. So, so let, let's, let, let's stop a little bit at Ben Gurion. So, yeah. at, at Ben Gurion, uh, uh, your studies clearly weren't enough, and you got involved in many uh, extracurricular activities, some very interesting and exciting ones, some that maybe helped define where you were going to go in life. Uh, t tell us about a couple of those things that you did um, that um, uh, are, are pretty impressive as a young person um, and, and very selfless. So go ahead, t tell us a little about some of those things. Sure, I would just let you know if you didn't see, Steve just wrote that you're also free to write any other question that we could add. Uh, I'd be happy to hear your, your questions. Um, so yeah, I went to Bangalore University um, I really wanted to do it because I heard a lot of things about Ben Gurion University, which is really a very social university. It's not like a, again, I love all the universities in Israel, but the atmosphere for us, for Israeli to leave Tel Aviv and to drive an hour and a half for us is like, you know, driving now, I don't know, to, to the other coast and to leave home is really like a small feeling of a kibbutz. And when you have that small feeling of the kibbutz, you are also participating like you're a kibbutz member and you really contribute to the society in Beersheba. So during uh, my five years in Ben Gurion University, I was trying to taste everything. Um, I started working with um, Ethiopian immigrants. Uh, we had a special program called SELA, which is like an initials for supporting women uh, Ethiopian uh, immigrants. Uh, it was schoolgirls that we tried to help them with their studies and education and to make them um, accessible for higher education. That was outstanding. Um, I also was working uh, on the Africa Center in uh, Ben Gurion University, actually helping to establish an Africa Center to study more about Africa and the culture. Um, and that was part of my work at the Student Union. Uh, the student union in Israel is in a very different structure than uh, in the USA and the one in Ben-Gurion is again very special because it is very, 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 very social. So my, my work there, I was the coordinator for social involvement in the campus as part of the um, student body and student university. I decided to apply to this role because before that I was very active in different student chapters. Uh, actually, me and my friends, we established a chapter to try and promote more discourse about sexual harassment in the campus and to have more rules by the university and to the administration, uh, how should they approach uh, this issue? Um, because sexual harassment to students by, unfortunately, not only students, but faculty and administration is common, again, not only in Israel, but it's uh, something that people don't like to speak about, which relates unfortunately to the whole world so as a student i tried and, and wanted a lot of things from the student union and then i decided okay i could be the one person on the other side that could help different students from all of the different backgrounds different political backgrounds right left feminist lgbtq all over whatever you want people who are speaking about sustainability everything they had to do is let me know for instance as an example that they have 50 people who want to do something and I would need to find a budget from the student union to support their activity. Um, so that was just a few short examples of the life in Ben Gurion University that I enjoyed a lot. So um, I, I, I was just on mute. I saw one of your tweets that talked about uh, uh, something that you say a lot now that you never said before in your life. And I, it was something like, whoops, I think I'm on mute. Well, I was just on mute. So look, you're, you're a person, a, a child, a daughter, um, who, who many on this call will be proud uh, to call their own. You, you are an activist. You, 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 don't, you see things that you don't think are right and you want to fix them. And, and, and clearly that probably uh, drove your career choice. I think the first thing you did is you sort of joined uh, Israel Aid and headed off to the Philippines. So. Uh, uh, T tell us about that. Uh, w w that was a disaster relief thing. I think most people on the call know that Israel is uh, on a per capita basis more active and involved in disaster relief around the world than any other country. Um, 
gets little recognition for it. So tell us a little something about ISRA aid and, and what you were doing in the Philippines. Yeah, so thank you for that. Uh, so I always wanted to go and, and to do some something not only for Israel, but for other people and to show also not only to show people who are Israeli people, but to learn from them uh, on the other side. And I really, I didn't know why, but I always had a dream, even before I started with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to be a diplomat and to work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I didn't have a words to explain it, but I said, okay, I should, I should try. I'll, you know, I always say if life would be like an ice cream shop, it would be much better because you ask, I want to taste a little bit of this, little bit, and then you decide. Um, so I said, okay, what can I lose? Uh, and I saw an, an job in the Philippines. I applied and said, okay, go to the Philippines. You're going to be our director for disaster relief after Super Typhoon Yolanda. Uh, they found that really struck badly in the Philippines who suffer every year with magnitudes of uh, typhoons. Um, they sent me to the middle of nowhere. It's, it's not like, you know, you think about a shiny life, living in a capital. It was to get from Israel, from Tel Aviv, to my bed in the other side in the Philippines. I had to go on a plane, land in Korea, in Seoul, then take a connection, land in the Philippines, in an island called Cebu. From Cebu, I had to take a three hours ferry, which was very rough and then from there to take um, like a small kind of a bicycle to get me to my house and only then I could start working um, and what we did in the Philippines um, actually my father always told me like when I told him okay I'm going to the Philippines I said, why are you doing that he, like he said maybe people he would be proud that I'll be their daughter I think my father eventually is proud, but he's, he's confused. He's very confused because he's a businessman, by the way, in the Negev, in the desert for many years. And he said, okay, but you do, do all these nice, nice things. I had, you know, in uniforms of uh, humanitarian aid, but how would you make a living? And I told him, you know, and I guess I'm lucky because not everyone could do it, but I'm happy with what I'm doing. And if it's not been, you know, the businessman that you are, um, that's what I prefer. Uh, I think he's happy, but he's still, you know, with all of these NGOs life, he's, he's very confused. Um, so I left to the Philippines, even though I didn't get his like great blessing. Uh, and we did an, an amazing project, which is by the way, still going on Israel. And, and I can speak a lot of good things about this Israeli NGO. His first coming and last going, like the, the super typhoon Yolanda was already seven years ago and they're still operating, still operating, operating by the way, in Japan and in many other countries. Uh, one of the main flag uh, projects that we did in the Philippines and it's cross cut uh, all over the project Israel has in the world is psychosocial support training. We take people from the community, if, if either it's uh, nurses, teachers, policemen and women and first responders and we give them training how to deal with trauma because we know it's it's just a matter of a day a year a month until the next trauma will hit the philippines and you know nowadays with covid with each and every one of us uh, and it was amazing because I, I still have friends in the philippines that we did training for and we get brought you know official and professional uh, social workers from Israel that did this training uh, and now with COVID-19 you know I, I'm, I'm looking on my Facebook and I see those people we did training for like years ago speaking about how they do it now to fellow members of the community due to COVID-19 so so it, it's amazing because you see that what you did you didn't waste your time you really invested your time your love your you know motivation with people and you gave them something from Israel because Unfortunately, if we like it or not, Israel is a post-traumatic country. Um, so if we could do a positive thing from that, that, that was, for me, a huge, a huge achievement. And, and so that, uh, and just uh, uh, maybe not everybody knows, but NGO is what uh, 
uh, everyone else in the world calls nonprofit organizations, right? Not non-governmental organizations, NGOs, just in case anyone wasn't sure. Um, like my father. Like your father. Well, I probably a similar age. And he, um, uh, but you, this then maybe inspired you to apply to civil service. Uh, t tell us what, 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 what was Actually, the... it was funny. It's funny you mentioned that because a lot of my friends, as and you mentioned, said, yeah, you are an activist. What are you doing now? You know, if it doesn't matter which side of you of the government, what you're working for a government. So it's working for a nonprofit and then moving to the government sounds strange to some people. And what I'm sharing with you, it's what I'm sharing with my friends as well. My experience in the Philippines actually brought words to my thoughts, as I told you before, that I didn't know why I want to be a diplomat because I really saw what they're doing. As I told you, I was far away in a very distant town, in a very distant island in the Philippines. But sometimes I took flights to Manila. Uh, I had to have like to establish board members. I need to fundraise, you know, you know that. Yep. Uh, and okay, as you said, like, I I'm flattered that you call me now young, but then I was much younger. <laughs> Like a, a child going to the Philippines and d alone needs to establish an like a local NGO. So I said, where should I go? I'll knock on doors. So one of the first do doors that I knocked is the Israeli embassy in Manila. I thought, I'm an Israeli. They're the Israel embassy. Should be interesting. So like I'm interested, they should be interested. And it was for me a long shot because I never, and for me to speak with an ambassador sounds like, you know, it's frightening. And I was surprised because they answered my call very quickly and said, yeah, yeah, the ambassador wants to meet you. I didn't like even thought that an ambassador will meet me. And from our conversation, I was quite amazed that they, now, now it's us because I'm part of it, but they back then was really curious to know and to understand what I'm doing, what I'm representing, what Israel is doing in the Philippines, because from them, you know, the, the Israeli embassy is, is a structure, it's an office full with people who try to represent the Israeli people, which I am doing actually without the government sending me uh, to do it back then in, in the Philippines. So they said, whatever you need, let us know. Do you want help with media? Yeah, sure, we can help you. Do you need help with getting to know people, yeah, come, come to dinner with us. We, we meet some people. And I was amazed. And I think it's a little bit like I told you with the student union. I said, okay, I want to be the person on the other side. Like after I finished my, my role in the Philippines, I want to help other like, Adva, by the way, in, in English, the term, like the meaning is a ripple. So I could say, I wanted to help a little more ripples to try and do what they want to do in some other places in the world. Awesome. And then I applied. And by the way, first time I was not ex like it's hard. So uh, I had to try a few times. Uh -huh. It's kind of like uh, getting a driving license. The, <laughs> um, so, um, so now you're in your uh, mid twenties, uh, you're back in Israel um, and, um, and you decide to apply, uh, you finally get accepted. And, and where do they ship you off to? So to my surprise, and I'll tell you in a minute why it was like my real surprise, to India. Uh, I was never like, maybe some of you that you know, know Israelis very well know that there is a lot of Israelis in India and Israelis love India, which is so true. I was never in India before. And I was quite, I was quite shocked because in the training uh, of, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at this, this stage, um, at the end of the training, they give us a list and you need to uh, put your priorities and either they will listen to you or not, but you give, you know, you give your own opinion. And I was sitting with my husband, Oded, and we had to this discussion and I said, okay, there was like 26 positions open and we had to rate 10. I looked at every one of those 26, some in Africa, some in Latin America, some in Asia, the US. And I said, okay, if there's one place that I'm sure that they will not put me specifically because of the role, not because of the country, 
is India. And then they told me, okay, you're going to India. <laughs> so I was quite surprised because I had a different role, like position that I thought about. Uh, so I was really, 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 really surprised. Yeah. And, and uh, just something a little quickly about uh, uh, your role there. We, we have a couple of pictures uh, of you uh, in India and, and uh, uh, maybe you could uh, uh, tell people what's going on in this picture. So um, I don't know if you remember this. This was from. I, I, I know everything. I, know, okay, I, I love this video, so by what's, the way. People for, can for see the, the audience, background. What, what's going people. on in this picture? Uh, for just for the audience, I will say that Don and I were not preparing with the pictures. So for me, it's like it's a, it's like a game. I, I don't know which picture is going to show, but I love it. Uh, so I'm on the left. Uh, my hair is much shorter. Uh, in the center is our public diplomacy officer, and on the right is our spokesperson. It's uh, March 8th, which is the International Women's Day, and we were interviewed by a local, when I say in India, local uh, newspaper, it's like, you know, millions of people read it. Uh, it was a national, I'm sorry, I think it was um, Indian Express, but never mind. Yep. Uh, speaking about the fact that uh, the Israeli embassy in New Delhi, India, has almost only women diplomats, a part of the ambassador who was a man. So we're very happy and we're taking a picture. Is that right? Was yep. that that? Yes. Good. So a gold star. And, and, and I think the headline was something like, at the Israel embassy, every day is Women's Day. That's right, because we were all women. Okay, Steve, let's look at the next one. Oh, that's right, great. Remember? Yeah, I see here um, many of my friends, my Indian friends. This is a delegation that I took. I'm just trying to see if this is the first or the second delegation I took. I think it's the second. I had two delegations that I took from Israel to India. In India, I was the political advisor of on domestic politics of India to the embassy and for hence for Jerusalem and the headquarters. So I had to understand, you know, the different parties in India and to see um, different young influential people in the um, Indian politics from all different uh, parties, right and left. Uh, it's a non-partisan issue to bring them to taste and explore Israel to know better so I think it's from my second delegation and wow. it's just, we did them a briefing in the embassy just before they went uh, to Israel. So that's the picture. So th this is a, uh, a group of in young I Indians. Um, Spokespersons uh, of different parties. From different parties. So they're involved in the government and part of what you did there to sort of build uh, more positive relations between the countries is uh, you brought them on a mission. You brought them to Israel and exposed yeah. them to, to the real Israel, um, which uh, all of us on this call are very committed to. So that's awesome. Uh, how long were you in India? It was three wonderful years. Amazing. And, and, and now you're here in the U.S. So all of this was for spice, as we say in the old country, um, uh, leading up to your current role. And you've been here for a little over a year. Um, and uh, you have a, a, a full uh, agenda, uh, a, as you explained it to me, there are three basic areas. Uh, I wanna ask you a little something about each and I wanna urge uh, now um, all of our participants uh, who can think of questions to let them fly. So the three main uh, areas that you focus on are academics. So that's uh, you know faculty, students, and administrators. You're, you're in charge of the social media uh, uh, programs for the council. For the, for the embassy, and, um, and then social impact. And, and by social impact, uh, m mostly what you focus on is finding ways to connect um, governmental and non-governmental U.S. groups or organizations, Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, with Israel or Israel organizations as, as a way to try and build a greater understanding and support. How did I do so far? Are you looking for a job? Yeah, no, no, thanks. So um, uh, look, l l let's start with academics. I, I think uh, most everyone on the call is aware that there was recently at Columbia University, a, uh, a student to sort of proclamation uh, 
um, uh, about, um, uh, I, I don't know exactly, boycotting Israel or something like that. Uh, t tell, us, tell us what you know about that and, and what, if anything, um, you know, the reaction was uh, or what, what, what you've done about it or can do about it. Sure. So yeah, it's, it's, for us, it's a tragic, even the fact that, you know, a proposal like that even, you know, comes to, to student body, it, it's terrible. Um, so actually a few months ago, there was a proposal for a vote, a BDS vote to uh, boycott and diverse from Columbia University from Israel. Um, that went to the student government. After it passes the student government in March, so it should go to the agenda for students uh, whenever the government of the students will decide. Just a short disclaimer, the, um, the vote was not in all Columbia University. It was in Columbia College. It doesn't mean that it's not important. It's important if, in both campuses, but just to understand the scale, it's much less students. We're speaking about uh, the Columbia College, which is the undergraduate and has around 3,000 students. Um, and by the way, many of uh, the question here and the question if to divest, yes or no, from Israel, it was not the, main, the agenda of, of the questionnaire. They have questions coming on many different topics. And one of them, unfortunately, is should uh, Columbia University, BDS, Israel, and Israel Academy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this vote went to the student body, which means all of the students in Columbia University. And we were hoping it will get, like, when I'm saying we're hoping, we're speaking all the time with, you know, an amazing young people who devote their day-to-day -day life really to, to first keep safe the student and the Jewish life there because BDS is not only about Israel, it's about anti-Semitism and it's about how a lot of Jewish people feel in the campus, threatened by, for their life. And of course, about Israel, about Zionism, and um, with the talks we had with our different partners in the campus, you know, they have so much uh, student activists, student bodies, organizations there that are pro-Israel. Uh, they were hoping that many of the students will not even vote on, on it. If they get less than 30%, their vote is not valid. Unfortunately, there was some kind of a... Um, it's not an email blast, but we call it an email blast about the issue, so much more students knew about it. And the, the vote had 38, I think, percent people who are voting for it. Um, so so the, the vote passed the student uh, body. The next step with, with those votes usually is that the student body could bring it up to administration and then the administration will decide what to do with it. We were not surprised uh, that administration and the president are very anti-BDS, and we were happy to get the president um, announcement just after, I think 15 minutes after the um, uh, vote was released, the, the results, that he's uh, not uh, approving BDS. And for us, it's good, but not enough. It's not good enough because we believe that even the students, the fact that we have an administration in our side claiming that they're not going to pass BDS, it's good. But we, we are um, concerned about young people, Jewish and non-Jewish, who see uh, a reason to boycott Israel and they do not like, we were okay with the discourse about Israel, about everything related to Israel, but the fact that we're speaking about in the campuses BDS, the only country in the world that students want to uh, boycott is Israel and not other, seems very anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic act, not right, and um, not the way to act. Um, so 
we are also in contact with administration and with the students and we're working to try and to change this matter and by the way i'm also approaching you i know many of you you even if in this call or not in the call but in the Maccabi usa graduate or their students are there that, that's a quick 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 critical time for all supporters of Israel and we should all act. And you know, Colombia, if we like it or not, is the future of America. People who go out to Colombia, they, they are influencers. Thank you. The, um, a, a couple of questions are coming in. Uh, one, I think uh, you can answer uh, quickly. The, um, and that is, uh, uh, you know, what, what's your territory? What, what colleges uh, do you work with? And, and uh, given that you're a regional person, are there people uh, like you in, uh, around the country also doing what you do? So my mother would say, nobody's like me, <laughs> but yes. So in generally, uh, all the people in the consulate in New York, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, sitting in the New York consulate, oversee five states. And in these five states, all of the colleges, the campuses are under my responsibility which is New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So of course, we're happy to have more relationship. It could be with the professor, with the faculty, with the university, with the students, everything. We would try to bring more Israel uh, content ideas. And it doesn't have to be, uh, I'm saying that because I'm sure that part of you are connected or have uh, friends, family, or yourself part of universities or colleges. It doesn't, I'm not speaking about, you know, Hasbara and having, you know, speaking about BDS and, but, you know, we're going to have a program in NYU uh, next week with the literature um, department bringing authors from Israel or movies from, speaking about, you know, pure academic content. Um, so we're also happy to expand that. So that was uh, the first part of your question. And those people who are like me, yeah, we have nine um, consulate and embassy all over the U.S. Uh, some are larger, some are smaller, but in each and every one of them, there is a person that his job is also to oversee academics. So uh, that's great. And I, I, I don't know if you know, but oh, 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 every four years, you know, there's a Maccabi um, and And of course, this in this cycle, because of COVID, it's been postponed. So... <laughs> It'll, it'll be in 2022 and not 2021. But a, a couple of caveat ago, we, uh, we um, evolved our pre, what we used to call a pre-camp into something called Israel Connect. And this is for all of our younger athletes. It's roughly 800 um, kids from 14 to 25, basically, that are in our open and our younger divisions. It's an amazing program. Um, we, we, we received uh, for this one a very um, uh, sizable grant from the Singer Foundation to uh, further upgrade that program. And a critical part of that program is, is empowering uh, kids to be able to go home and uh, um, have a, a compelling and convincing response and argument um, for this uh, uh, BDS um, crap. So that's a technical term. The, uh, anyway, I just want you to know, and, and hopefully maybe in 2022, there are ways that we can work together uh, with you, you and your colleagues as, the, as the, especially the 400 or so college students come back, uh, can be connected with you guys and, and we could have a more of a organized effort. Great idea. Right, to take what they're learning. They're coming back all enthused, feeling more Jewish and proud of their Jewishness than ever and empowered to sort of be forces on campus. Um, but, but we don't have an organizational system then to deploy them. So maybe- uh, oh, By the way, Don, it, it reminds me, you know, it's Jewish or non-Jewish, like a webinar that we did, and I think would be interesting uh, to share in this regard. Uh, we had a, a webinar and we're going to do it with other schools as well, with different uh, Afro-American uh, basketball players that played in Israel, in the national uh, leagues in Israel. There are over than, than 30, 50 uh, Afro-American uh, players. For us, they're very famous because, you know, they are the stars in Israel. 
uh, that played professionally in Israel and they come back and in these webinars, they speak with people, you know, again, Jewish or non-Jewish, people who like sports or doesn't like sports, just about their experience in Israel. And in a very moving act, we had um, the first webinar we did like that was just on the day, on the day that George Floyd was murdered. And again, it was before everything, you know, changed and all the discourse changed. It was really on that day. Uh, and Derek Shop, one of the players that I guess some of you uh, might know, said, for me, as a black person, Israel was the safest place that I felt. And you know, that's a very empowering message. The, um, you know, interestingly, that program is why you're here tonight, because uh, Steve Graber, who's our staff person, um, was aware of that program. We actually then replicated it. We did a similar one uh, in a format like this with the author and, and right Steve with some of those same basketball players I didn't so, know that yeah so we copied you but that's how we found out about you and um and Steve uh, reached if someone out someone is copying it means that it was great and I'm so happy that's to correct. hear that yes it's it's uh, the highest form of flattery so anyway thank you for your leadership and thank you for giving us that idea and we'd love to think about other ways that we maybe could jointly sponsor um, some programs like that um, in the future. Um, so t t tell us that social media is such a dangerous uh, 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 medium now, um, and so much hate uh, is uh, uh, flying across social media. To tell us what you're doing in that regard and, and, uh, and, and what, if any, successes uh, you maybe have had in trying to combat the sort of vicious uh, hate that's uh, on social media? Yeah, so I think um, there is a lot of hate. Uh, I'm trying to take it also to the, sounds very 60s, but to the love. Uh, we're trying to share what Israel is, is really is, what we're doing. Um, it could be with, you know, Innovation and startup, we're introducing every week what Israel, even here in New York, all the Israeli who are doing an amazing uh, startup companies here to show it. We had an amazing uh, LGBTQ campaign that we took some of you know our best 50, 50 friends that are for us the most influential people that are pro-Israel and LGBTQ in New York and the area. And they spoke about uh, in the Pride Month, what is pride to them. And they're also proud, not only in their LGBTQ, but with Israel. And the fact that Israel is a very open LGBTQ space uh, is something that we are trying to, to show the world with all of this complexity that we are aware and know of. Um, we just have now on Sukkot a very special uh, Ushpizin, uh, Ushpizin guests in, in the Sukkot, the eight guests of Sukkot. We brought um, different eight in each day, a uh, different person, a Latino person, to honor them in the um, Hispanic month, Hispanic Heritage Month, in our Sukkah. So we built like a virtual Sukkah and we spoke with each and every one of them. Some of them like, Kunit Chancellor and some of our in ballet and very different people and some in politics. And actually, I, I could tell you, I'm, I'm so happy. Our social media is really, really rising, is really good. Uh, I'll be very honest that I'm putting a lot of effort in Instagram now uh, because so many young people and millennials just um, decide about what they think and explore the world through that and of course other as well but it's it's really amazing to see when you invest in in social media in different platform you get back um, and yeah sometimes we get also mean responses but it's okay yeah the um uh we have a question which uh uh uh, touches on the, uh, uh, you, you mentioned George Floyd and, and, and the protests and the demonstrations. 
and um, uh, uh, the, the um, question, the broader question is, um, how effective have you been in reaching out to the Black or African American community here? Um, some of whom, especially some uh, more radical elements, are seem to be very anti-Israel. Um, uh, uh, some associated with Black Lives Matter seem to have said some very anti-Semitic, anti-Israel stuff. What, what can you tell us about uh, your um, efforts uh, to build bridges with the um, Black or African American community? So I think as, as our role in the Consulate of Israel in New York, we are trying to approach communities. Um, that, that's, that's the story here in, uh, in America, in New York specifically, uh, community, community life. And as we try to reach out to Hispanic, we do the same with Black and Jewish and other communities. Uh, with different webinars we're doing, we had like uh, webinars that we always bring um, Afro-American speakers as well. We are trying to have projects with low-income communities, um, either in New York, outside of New York, and you know the a lot of the statistics will say that those low-income communities are immigrants communities either Afro-American. We do a lot of projects also in, uh, with, with the Puerto Rican community in New York. Uh, Israel uh, in New York is always part of SOMOS, if you know SOMOS, uh, the greatest supporter of the Puerto Rican community. Um, annually summit. I think this year, unfortunately, it will not be physically in Puerto Rico but right. we are still supporting the efforts. Um, we're having, um, just recently, we had, um, it was a webinar that we tried to speak, no, it's gonna be, sorry, next week, a webinar we're speaking and dedicating with different um, speakers, not only from Israel or the US, but also from Ethiopia. Uh, we're speaking about low income and COVID. We had, uh, if we speak, you asked specifically about Black Lives Matter and cooperation uh, and their approach with Israel. We had fabulous supporters with different organizations that rose, so Blacks supporting Israel. I don't know if you know about uh, Ipsy Institution. Uh, we partner with them with different, unfortunately now it's a lot of webinars, but showing uh, other side, because there are a lot of black people who understand that Israel could work uh, with the black communities. Israel also have its own uh, black story. And maybe it's a different story. And I can tell you that I think it was just two, three months ago, we had a very, very interesting uh, webinar that we brought Danny Limor. Danny Limor is the, he was the director of um, Brothers Operation, the operation who brought the Ethiopian Jews, rescued the Ethiopian Jews um, through Sudan to Israel. I don't know if, if you watch and now so many people have so much time because of COVID, but in Netflix, there is a very good movie called um, The Red Sea Resort, Diving Resort. It was amazing. Uh, yeah, yeah. it was amazing. So it, it shared the story about how um, the Israeli Mossad actually had a fake hotel resort of diving in Sudan in order to help to escape thousands of Ethiopian Jews. And that webinar we did with, you know, people of color. And for, for us, sometimes we feel, is it the same story? Should, can we compare? I don't think that for me, you know, I didn't choose to be black or white, but if a black person say to me, I'm interested to hear this story, that's a story that we want to share. That's, that's awesome. We really appreciate it. And um, so you've been here for a little over a year. Um, if you had to say, um, what was sort of the most, uh, your greatest accomplishment? Like you're talking to your mom or your dad and, and, and you say, I'm so proud of X, what, what would it be? 
Um, so I don't know if it's proud. I can tell you that I was super excited. Uh, it's not something that I did, but I was still part of. So I was very, very excited that uh, it was two weeks ago, I think. Maybe I was super excited as well because it's the first time that I went to face-to-face -to -face meeting after like six months, but the content was also very exciting. Uh, we went to meet our counterparts in the Amirati, the United Emirates uh, Consulate, the UAE. And it was very moving, like for me, you know, again, it's not something that was, I, I didn't act for the piece. I uh, didn't do anything. I was sitting in my office and it happened while other very cre creative and dedicated diplomats all over the world did that. But the fact that, you know, I was able to go, I was invited to their office and we had a discussion of, okay, how are we together now, Israel and the UAE in New York could empower this discourse, this important discourse of peace because New York has you know america and specifically new york it, it's a symbol it's a symbol and a lot of it could we could create more and to influence by the way those same students that speak about bds while we're promoting peace so that that, that was like super exciting they were very kind they were they, again i know don that you were searching my twitter so i guess you already saw it but they went and and bought us especially rogalach Huh. That was, you know, amazing. I was crying, really. The um, I, I want to uh, turn uh, to Maccabi business now. Um, but before I do, I have one question came from Donna Orander, one of my fellow officers. Uh, do you do any work with the American Israel Friendship League? Of course, they're very good friends of us. Okay, I thought I thought so, but uh, so there's your answer, Donna. So we we talked a little bit. First of all. I, I don't know if everyone knows, but you're, you said you uh, uh, skated uh, this and that, but you also run. And, and there was some sort of half marathon or 12K competition in Jerusalem some time ago, the diplomatic corps or something, and it seems you placed pretty high. T tell us about that experience. Yeah, so um, we have uh, in our highest uh, people in, in the ministry, they're very sports, sports people. So they initiated five years ago the first um, Israeli diplomat uh, race. Uh, the fun thing was, you know, they invite all of the ministry was invited to participate, but also, of course, diplomats from all over the world who are posted in Israel. Um, so yeah, so I was in the race and I got uh, third place. Wow. So, yeah. Uh, Mazel Tov. All right. Uh, uh, one but other. It was question. only 10k. It was 10k. I, uh, only 10k. Okay. Well, it's not, uh, half, it's not half a marathon, but I did the half a marathon of Tel Aviv a few years okay. back. Okay. So I think I mentioned to you that uh, there's an amazing, as part of the Maccabi, uh, I think half marathon. I think it's a half marathon. Anyway, we're hopeful if it's possible that perhaps in 20, July 2022, you'll be able to join us. Um, uh, uh, there, there are uh, uh, runners representing their countries, but also regular Israelis can run. So I don't know if you'll represent Israel or the U.S. or, or the the the. the well, I'm the, a regular Israeli. Okay. Well, um, anyway, we would love to have you join us. But give us a little insight. Um, uh, 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 when, growing up, or or even later in life, what what did you know about uh, the Maccabi? Was this something you actually knew about? Uh, what was your impression? Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Uh, uh, give, give us a sense of what a typical Israeli Tel Aviv Nick um, uh, uh, thinks or knows about the Maccabi. So I think that's due to a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, I'm not the typical Tel Aviv Israeli for the Maccabi because I have a very, very good friend that she's like um, Israeli American. So she has a lot of family in, in the US and you know she knows a lot about like I learned a lot from her about Jewish world beyond what we know in Israel because it's much more than what most of Israelis know until they're like teens and, and young adults. Um, so I heard from her about the Maccabiya and I heard from her that she's working in this Maccabiya and she had like answering phone calls. And so I knew a little bit 
about that before. Uh, unfortunately, one of you know my strongest memories until today, also because of uh, a personal connection, is is the disaster, the the disaster with the bridge. Uh, one of my friends, like maybe that's not true, by the way, but my memory from being in high school and having you know learning about that. One of our friends, my classmate, his father was connected to the architect who who built this bridge. Um, so you know, even today, when you know, sometimes I, I was living in Tel Aviv, I'm running a lot, so I'm passing through the Yarkon and Ganei Ashua. I'm passing bridges, and I'm thinking about these you know, terrible times. Like it's it, it, and it's something that I also like. I spoke with my friend just before. I said, "Yeah." I, she said, what, You're, you have what now, uh, Maccabi USA? What is it, like a friend from Israel? So I explained to her and I told her about the Maccabi, and that was also the, her strongest memory, unfortunately. See, there are, I think, many people on the call that don't know what you're talking about, so um, uh, who are maybe first timers to uh, uh, Maccabi programming. So, uh, t t tell them a, a short version of the terrible tragedy that happened. Yeah, so again, and, and excuse me that I don't remember the exact year, That's okay. um, so but I, one of, one of I, the Maccabi... I, I, I am sure that, I'm sure there are some people on this call who were actually there, um, uh, who maybe uh, could fill in some of the details. Uh, yeah. If someone raises their hand, we'll call on them, but tell us what you remember. 97, yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, in the 90s, I, I was like in the sixth, seventh grade, and um, we had the Maccabiya, which is, again, it's a, a celebration for Jewish life, for athletes. Uh, and, and in the opening ceremony, they went over a bridge and unfortunately it, it, it collapsed. And with it, some of the athletes, of course, all of the Maccabiya was canceled. Nothing continued to happen. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. People died there, and also part of the the disaster is not only the, the happened because of the bridge and its collapse, but also the bad water we had there in the Alcon. Two of those things were treated later, but it's 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 a very black spot in in the history of of Israel for Tel Aviv for athletes. Thank you, and I, and I know um, it made a huge, impre huge impression on you. Uh, Alfred was saying that it was not canceled, but again, yeah. uh, it's such a deep memory from my yeah. childhood. For us, it was not the same. Yeah, and-, and I'm uh, sorry for the, it was for, not- uh, So we, um, uh, uh, we, we have uh, with us one of our uh, veteran uh, leaders, Fred Schoenfeld, who I, I think was there then. I don't know, Fred, I think we unmuted you if you want to say a little something about uh, that experience. Uh, you're, you're, I think you're still on mute. Uh, Steve, could you unmute him? Yeah, I'm trying. Fred, you might have to click it yourself. It's not letting me uh, do it. Uh, okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I just got the shivers after you you mentioned that uh, in, <coughs> it was in 1997, and we were assembling we were assembling as usual all the thousands of athletes in the parking lot before coming in, and of course um, what happened was that once the team started moving over the bridge, and Australia was I think number two, and that's when the bridge collapsed, and we. We never knew about it because we were way, way back. But then after all the mayhem started, we finally realized what had happened. And uh, I don't remember the number of people who went into the water and the water was slightly polluted as perhaps the Haya Khan is today much cleaner than it was in those days. But in those days, it was uh, very toxic and people went into the water. And unfortunately, I believe four people drowned and many, many more were uh, affected. And uh, it was a real tragedy. However, the Maccabea, as, as difficult as it was, went on. 
and uh, we finished the games, but it was really, really terrible, terrible thing, which uh, I think everybody who, has, who was there that day, all the thousands of people will never forget. Thank you, Fred. Not only those who were there, as you see. Yes, okay. So um, uh, it's uh, unbelievable, but somehow uh, it's already an hour. Um, I, I don't know, Steve, if you, uh, were there any questions that I uh, missed? Um, uh, there was one question that just came in, Adva, if you could talk about the role of sports in building goodwill for Israel and building bridges across global communities. I couldn't hear the beginning. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, uh, w f from your perspective, what role does or should sports play uh, in, in, in your work in building bridges between uh, Israel and America and the rest of the world? Um, and I think in particular, uh, uh, we, we have now some uh, pretty uh, well-known Israeli athletes that are playing professional sports here. And, and do you have uh, connections with them? Um, uh, are, are they helpful? Uh, uh, to you and your colleagues in trying to, uh, you know, accomplish your goals? Yeah, so I think it's, it's a great question. I see sports, um, one of the most efficient tools that diplomacy has. Um, because, you know, at the end, I'm not trying, like, if I'll go and speak with people, hey, I want to change your mind about Israel, like, Nobody wants to listen to me and I don't want to listen to myself because that's not a, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show real people, real activities. And I think that sports, which a lot of people are very interested of, and sometimes, you know, it just put people aside their thoughts. They love the game so much and they're more open to listen and to understand and to hear um, other cultures, other ideas. It's not special for Israel. It just a worldwide phenomenon. And I think that understanding that and understanding that we're especially working in the US, which is such, you know, that's the fan uh, country. It's amazing. I, I, for you, maybe it's something that you grow up with, but for me as a foreigner here, you know, to see the love and the affection that you have for different sports, it, you know, uh, when I started tweeting here and looking on the trends on, on Twitter, I was asking my colleagues, what is this? Oh, that's hockey something. What is this? Oh, that's baseball something. Like, it's so rich. And I think that for us to connect uh, that to Israel, and to, when I'm saying to connect is sharing sometimes stories, like we spoke about the basketball, we have the Israeli baseball team, and we have you. You have what you're doing, which I think is amazing. We're speaking about a young Jewish millennials that don't know anything about Israel, to bring them to Israel because, or other places, because they love sports. And then they learn a, a thing or two about Israel and the Jewish world, of course, that's, that's a blessing. And I think that we could think about more ways to do that, again, to Jewish and non-Jewish audience. I know that many of you are connected to different teams and groups, and, and I'm open to ideas because I think that's an avenue that we really want to promote more. So I, I, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. I love the way you ended. Um, on, on many, many of our programs, besides building a, a community and building a connection and exposing people to the great work that we do and maintaining connection with our athletes, we often end conversations just the way we're ending this one, with a commitment to find a way to work together moving forward. There, the, we touched on some. There's something called Fun Runs that the uh, New York Embassy helped co-sponsor, and we're going to try and do that again, and we'll definitely be in touch with you about that, and, and uh, reaching out to some of the Israelis that are or, or former Maccabi USA athletes who are playing professionally now in baseball um, or, or in other sports. Um, uh, we're very much looking forward to it. We very much appreciate your being here. Uh, we're happy that your husband was able to keep, keep uh, uh, your daughter uh, 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 entertained for this uh, whole period. And, and, and uh, all the best from all of us to you for all the great work that you're doing. We're very proud of you.
Thank you very much. And I, I really enjoy the conversation and I'm, I really want to be sincere and to tell you that you not only Don and Steve, but each and every one of you and not those only that are in the call, but others, I wrote my email. You could write me with any idea or any other question. What we're trying to do is to connect to the people. You are the people, you are on the ground. You know, I, I'm a foreigner here. I do not know America. I know it through your eyes. Um, so whatever you think uh, could be uh, useful to strengthen the relationship between Israel and the US in those five states that I mentioned or others because I, connect, I can connect you to my colleagues we would be happy really in every one of the pillars and, and others. Really appreciate it. And, and as we're closing, I want to, uh, a, a number of my uh, colleagues from 30 plus years ago working in the Jewish Federation field, uh, I want to say hello uh, and thank you for joining us. And uh, as we're signing off, um, we're going to uh, uh, play a little music. And uh, thanks again for joining us. If, if you're so inclined, please go to our website and consider making a contribution. Thank you. Toda. Toda Rabbi.